So I'm standing on the Arctic sea ice, floating on the ocean, looking out, and I'm surrounded by my friends, the Inupiaq, who are hunters and have lived here for generations, for a long, long time. And we've gotten here, and it's been a long time. It's been a long time getting here. It's been weeks and weeks of breaking ice and breaking trails out to get from the shore the tundra all the way out to the ocean's edge. And so I'm looking around and it's calm and beautiful. And of course, now I know is the time to start shooting some landscapes. So I reach over, grab my camera and start changing lenses. But here, the snow isn't normal snow. So it's got salt in it because this is uh, the ocean. And so um, I shield my camera body and hover over it as I'm changing lenses so that I don't get that salt inside the camera. And as I'm in the middle of it, all of a sudden I hear, Nanuk! Nanuk! Which means polar bear in Inupiaq. Um, so when you hear that, um, you can feel the tension from uh, Inupiaq hunters. That's a frightening thing because they are the calmest most stable people that I know. And so I start looking out around me. And to my left and to my right, there were just ice boulders. Boulders about the size of a human or about the size of a polar bear in different shades of white and blue and yellow. And I keep looking around and I don't see anything. It's making me really nervous. And as I look out, Suddenly, I can start to see that one of the boulders is rising. It's <laughs> rising up and it's starting to move, and it's a bit hard to tell us exactly what's going on, but everyone else around me knows what's going on. I see, and I can hear Larry clicking the barrel, uh, clicking the chamber on his rifle open and searching in his pockets as he's looking for bullets, but there are no bullets in his rifle. And I look to my right, and Muckalik has just slid across the ice and grabs his rifle and he brings it up in one smooth motion, sights it and shoots. And this boulder has moved forward and has momentum as it's moving forward like a train and it falls forward in the ice and collapses and it keeps sliding forward several feet. So later, we are looking for the story of this Nanook in, in its tracks. And apparently it had walked or it actually climbed out of the sea, downwind of us, having smelled our skin boat, come around and then seen that two of our crew were walking around, um, fixing some things on the snow machines and away from the larger group and it was trying to cut them off. Fortunately for them, they walked back to the main group and that polar bear snuck behind those ice boulders and came um, uh, at us in the most direct line as close as it possibly could to us. Um, it's not a normal thing for uh, a polar bear to want to come after eight grown men. Um, and when we butchered the meat and sent the meat off to the elders um, and looked inside its mouth, it had two broken canines, uh, which we don't know why that happens. It's from age or sickness. But we do know that that bear, which was eight and a half feet from nose to the tip of its tail, would have been 10 feet tall standing, but it was really, really skinny. And so attacking um, that group of eight of us is a move of desperation. And, but that is life on the sea ice. My name is Kili Ryan. Um, I am both Han Chinese and indigenous Nanai. I'm, my family comes from Manchuria, which is this region of the world, um, which includes southern Siberia and northern China. I'm, the hunter-gatherer side of my family is uh, from both sides of the Amur River. Uh, Siberia is a really huge place, as you can see. Um, you can easily fit the United States within it. Uh, um, but over here is North Alaska, the Alaskan Arctic, and where we're going to spend the first part of our little journey through the Arctic here. Um, when I grew up, I spent a lot of time listening to my grandmother's stories. That was a really pivotal thing for me um, as, I, uh, as a kid. And one of the things, I'll, I'll, one of the stories I always remember is her telling me the story of being out fishing with her dad and catching a fish. And when they brought the fish up, this armored fish, this giant sturgeon, it was bigger than the canoe that they were in. 
Uh, and the other story that I really remember very clearly is the story of my namesake, Kili, who is one of our culture's heroes. And he went on an odyssey. There was a time when his village was starving and no fish had not shown up, and so he went on an odyssey to go find the master of the sea to, to wake him up and tell him to let the fish come down to the village. And on the way, he rode on the backs of orcas, and he passed by uh, seals who were dressed as women and avoided the temptation of that. Does that sound familiar? Um, so I grew up in a world of myth and a world of story, um, believing in all of these things. And uh, you know, ever since I've been a kid, I, in a way, because my family was displaced by communism, displaced by the Cultural Revolution, many members of my family were killed by communism, um, and we fled all over the place. So I have been searching for home. I have, I, it's taken me a long time to realize this, but yes, I've been searching for home essentially everywhere I go. Um, I've been living with indigenous communities in remote areas for much of my life and spent a lot of time around different elders and trying to get back the thing that I've lost. I'm, and the one place where I've been drawn to for a long time is the Arctic. Because in the Arctic, the people are still close to the seals and the whales and there's a continuum that the line between human and animal and land is not so clear and it's all still one thing. So I find myself drawn to the Arctic. And in the Alaskan Arctic, it's pretty mythical. One of the things that um, I was drawn to immediately as a photographer is the sheer beauty and scale and a sort of um, ethereal quality to everything that is out here. And it's alive as well. Uh, between the bowhead whales, which are the second largest whales after blue whales, belugas, bearded seals, eiders, there's all kinds of amazing life out here. But in a way, everything kind of speaks the same language, this quiet language. And the sea ice is not all just a flat sheet of ice. Uh, if you can imagine it, it's uh, got mountains and valleys. It's a bunch of tectonic plates that run into each other. And out here, it's even more magical because the sun never sets and the color always never quite looks like it's daytime. There's always a kind of a sense that it's a perpetual twilight in the middle, especially in the springtime. One of the other things that drew me to the Alaskan Arctic is that um, with the Inupiaq, who are an Inuit people, um, they continue to hunt whales to this day. They have an unbroken tradition of whaling and um, it's done from skin boats. There are all kinds of skin boats across the Arctic, but this type of skin boat is called an umyak, which is a, um, made of driftwood and then covered with the skins of seals and then sewn together. Um, if you can imagine, this one is just 20 feet long, which is typical for uh, the North Slope. And um, if you can imagine being in this thing and um, harpooning a whale, then you have a good imagination. <laughs> All right. But of course, also, um, this is a place where I'm, when people think about whaling, they think about the violence of hunting and the violence of whaling. But whaling is perhaps 1% throwing a harpoon. It's 99% standing around disappearing into the landscape, turning off your brain and listening and becoming part of the land. We spend a lot of time standing and watching for whales and listening to the sounds of the eiders go by and just waiting and waiting. So it's, the Arctic is full of this romance and one of the reasons why it's full of this romance is that there are mirages everywhere. When you look out over the sea, there is, a, there is a mirage called the Fata Morgana that levitates things above the surface of the water. I mean, this umyak feels like it's coming out of a time of myth. But the reality is that the Arctic is a harsh place and it's a real place. And even, um, even in the springtime, it can still be quite cold, especially when you're on polar bear watch. 
in the middle of the night when the ice fog comes in and coats everything and the hoarfrost starts to build up, that's when it really starts to get cold. Um, it's uh, already, by this time of the spring, it's already 15 degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, pretty warm. It's not that bad. But when you're coated in ice frost and there's that humidity in the air, it's really cold. Another reality that everyone has to face, of course, is the receding of the sea ice. Um, on this, this spring, when we were out whaling, we're only uh, a mile away from town because the sea ice is only a mile wide. Um, and that's really unusual. It's not that long ago that the sea ice was 8 to 15 miles away. Right? A whole different land, a completely different world where you're uh, completely cut off from the world of the tundra and the world of the land where everything is solid. Polar bears are also a really uh, significant thing here and we interact with polar bears uh, in, in the Alaskan Arctic quite a lot, especially because uh, during whaling season they know. They um, have had this relationship with the Nupiak for centuries, for millennia, and they come around during whaling season knowing that there's food. But it's a tense relationship sometimes. Uh, although this Inupiaq looks like he's hunting, he's not, for the most part, Inupiaq are not um, out to shoot polar bears for hunting, but are on guard. Um, this Nanook is walking around uh, us as a group, uh, and even though there, are, there is a lot of uh, whale meat hanging out, it would rather have meat on the hoof, as it were. So it's looking for the children, and the kids are in the middle of our group, and the guards are on the outside posted. but it can be a little bit surreal sometimes. But there's nothing really surreal when you get close to a polar bear. It's a real thing of flesh and blood, and you're reminded when you look into its eyes how much you're flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about Inupiaq is how hard they've worked to bring tradition um, into their world to keep themselves and their culture strong and powerful and to keep their sense of identity. When we're whaling out there, the, one of the traditions is to wear the whaling parka. Um, and the parka is a lot more than just ice camouflage. Um, it's something that you earn. It's a badge of honor. Your crew will give you a parka when you've done enough service for the whaling crew. And young people get involved from a very young age. Um, these two teenagers here um, have been whaling since they were really young. But you can see that they haven't earned their parkas yet. Bowhead whales are huge. Um, that umiak is uh, 18 to 20 feet long. That bowhead whale is about three times its size. And one of the things um, that happens, though, uh, when we see the whales passing by is that umiak hunting is ambush hunting. We sit on the edge of the ice with the umiak sitting on the ice waiting for a whale to pass by. And it's like a floating platform, so we'll push it out. We'll push that uh, boat out when the whale comes by and throw the harpoon at it. But many, many times I've seen the whales coming. The whale is coming and I'll say to the umielak or the captain, the whaling captain, Captain, there's a, there's a whale coming. And he'll look at it and he'll look at me and he'll say, that one's not for us. That one's not for us. That one hasn't chosen us. That one's not giving itself to us. And on this occasion, I remember this, this whale came by right in front of us, and it was the perfect position, and our umiak was ready, and we were sitting there, and the captain just looked at it passing by. He said, that one's not for us. Watch. And the whale dove, and it disappeared. And a few minutes went by, and I forgot about it. It was just zoning out, looking out over the water again. And a few minutes later, it came back up 100 yards away, right in front of our neighboring crew who had pushed their umiak out. And it came up and rolled onto its back and just hung out there slowly. And the crew came up and threw the harpoon at it. Whaling is a community affair. Um, it takes somewhere between 50 to 100 people to tow a bowhead whale up onto the ice once it has been harvested. And um, it, whaling is central to Inupiaq culture because if you all have to work together to survive in order to bring this whale up, then if your, your culture becomes very communal, very cooperative. 
right? So the whale brings everyone together and the highest calling that anyone has in this culture is to be a provider, is to be someone who, to be one of the whaling captains who um, is able to bring the whale to feed the people. And the meat and blubber are proportioned out traditionally uh, through a system called nyinye, which uh, in which all of the crews and everyone in the village has gotten a, a gets an equal share. The, the crews get all an equal share and then everyone in the village gets a portion of the whale. Despite the fact that Christianity has, uh, came to the Arctic a long time ago, even still, I hear people say that Christianity is a mask for our traditional, traditional beliefs, and there's a lot of animistic beliefs um, in the Nupiak culture that still remain, and, and some of them are merged together. I mean, but there are moments when you see this spirituality, when you see the um, non-separation between human and animal, and this is one of those moments. The successful whaling crews in the summertime that's the one time they really get to revel in the joy of the community. Everyone comes together and there the whaling crews are thrown into the air in what's called the blanket toss. And you, for the, for the crew, the people of your community, literally, you have to trust them. You have to trust them to keep you from falling down. <laughs> if you, uh, when you land, there is nothing holding you up except for everyone else's arms. So as uh, time goes on, uh, Nupiak, like everyone else, everywhere else, um, are modernizing. Globalization has touched everybody. And, um, but even still, um, young Stephen here, who's seven years old, has been, this is his second year out on the sea ice. Um, his, his dad, the whaling captain, Kalu, um, wants him to be out here so that he stays away from video games and learns to be a hunter. This elder, Fanny Akpik, she is a big proponent of Inupiaq language learning. So um, in her lifetime, she was sent to boarding schools and had the language and culture um, forcibly removed from her. And so now she's become a big proponent um, and she managed the, manages the North Slope's um, education curriculum. Uh, language is a really big part of that. So for the Inupiaq, they have a really beautiful, wonderful culture. I know that we in Siberia look up to them. Um, but despite the fact that so in non-native non -native narratives, we get a lot of romance of indigenous peoples. And we just saw a lot of romance, a lot of myth. And it's one of the things that, that drew me to the Arctic in the first place. But also, of course, it's not all beautiful and wonderful. Just like with every other culture, every other place, every other society, when there are problems. Um, my next project took me to um, another Inuit culture on this island here called St. Lawrence Island, which is between Russia and Alaska. And on it are two communities of Siberia and Yupik. Um, it belongs to the United States, so everyone also speaks English. Um, these two communities are 700 people each, and it has a secret. The secret here is that the suicide rate on this island is 17 times what it is for the mainland U.S., the, the greatest suicide rate in the world. And before you think that it's because of the isolation and the cold, I'll tell you that the next two highest suicide uh, rates are in Fiji and Western Australia. Right, so, um, yeah, even the beach can't save you from, from, uh, from terrible things happening to your culture. Um, all three of those places, um, it's indigenous communities that are suffering from the suicide. Uh, and suicide is not, a, between native cultures and non-native cultures, is not the same. For um, non-native cultures, suicide it tends to be, it, it increases greatly as you get older. And it speaks a lot about modern society. It tells us how we value elders, how we treat the people that have come before us. Um, for native communities, it is 15 to 25, that age group that tends to kill themselves. Um, and it's a serious problem. St. Lawrence Island is a gorgeous place. Uh, 
But by and large, this is a place where colonization has hit really hard. And an entire generation of people were pulled off of this island and sent to Washington and Oregon to live in boarding schools and had their language removed and their culture removed. So generation, two generations later, we're looking at uh, everyone living in government housing from the 1960s. Um, but nonetheless, there's only so much you can do to change uh, the fundamental parts of a culture, as everyone is still very family-oriented. Um, and uh, ev the language of Siberia and Yupik is still spoken extremely well here. But it's an awful place for some, for many. Um, when I was here and went into people's homes, I discovered there were holes and lots of walls and there was snow on the floor. And in many of the homes, there's not enough mattresses for everyone to sleep at night. Uh, in fact, the problem is so bad that in the school, kids fall asleep regularly and the rule is that you can't wake a sleeping kid for at least 20 minutes because everyone knows that the kids don't sleep at night. St. Lawrence is also a subsistence community, and in fact, um, the cost of living here is 267 times what it is, or sorry, 267% what it is in the U.S. mainland. But even if you had money and wanted to buy your food, it would be really hard. When I was there, there was a bag of onions at the general store, there were two freezers of beef, and there was some boxes of cereal. So one of the things that I've begun to do with um, projects with uh, native communities is to m ensure that even if I come back with photographs, if they have photographs never see the light of day, that my presence there has been beneficial to the community. I mean, for too long, it's been that people parachute in from the outside and take, take, take. Even if it's only photographs, you are asking people to give of themselves, give trust and love of themselves, and very rarely do photographers or journalists give back. So I collaborated with the Bering Strait School District to come up with um, a program uh, for suicide prevention, and we agreed that an art therapy project would be the way to go. Um, I was inspired by my colleague Lynn Johnson's work uh, with uh, PTSD soldiers, and one of the things about, uh, to, uh, about suicide is that it's really hard to visually represent suicide. How do you know how a person is feeling on the inside? So we decided that we would make masks, and each of the kids uh, that we worked with would make two masks, one to represent the grief of the people they've lost, or perhaps they're a suicide survivor, and they feel that grief and that pain, and then the other one is to represent the beauty and the hope that they still see, because their lives Everyone is born a blank slate. You are not born into this world with pain or with joy. Um, and of course the families still are so powerful and so strong. So we had the masks of grief and the masks of hope. Suicide touches everyone in this community and not just suicide but also um, it has one of the highest cancer rates in the world as well. Uh, due to the fact that everyone eats marine mammals, and these marine mammals have been collecting um, PCBs and mercury, which goes up the food chain and poisons people over time. Uh, so once again, it's an indigenous culture which is suffering from things of which they uh, contribute to the least. Um, but everyone is touched by suicide because everyone has known someone directly who they've lost. And in some cases, there have been murders and suicides. When I was there, the one person who had been lost most recently was um, a boy that everyone loved, all the teenagers loved. He was a dear friend, and he was a star basketball player. And so I remember walking by this basketball court over and over and looking and noticing that no one was playing basketball anymore. Normally in wintertime, everyone goes out to shoot hoops. Yes, this is just... Uh, when you live in the Arctic, you got to play in the snow. <laughs> um, but no one was playing basketball. But there's lots of joy. There's lots of joy in this community and lots of kids. 
And it's just still a really beautiful place I, when you see the way that people interact with each other and the love that they have for each other, which is a really strong indigenous quality. Um, and so when we look at the masks that people wore of hope, and had a lot to do with family, including the feeling of responsibility for taking care of your siblings, and the joy of food, joy of eating together with people and with your family and making food. But on St. Lawrence Island, no one is uh, no one is free from the influences of even pop culture. Television has been here for a long time, and the crazy thing that television and internet have brought to this place, which has, um, you know, doesn't have very much, but it has television, and it gives all the young people a glimpse into a world that seems incredibly fabulous, but which they have no way of accessing. On top of that, it's hard for them to do this traditional subsistence living as well because the walrus have vanished. The walrus have disappeared. As the sea ice recedes and disappears, um, originally hunters could just walk onto their own shores and sneak up on walrus um, and take just what they needed. Then, um, this year, they're having to get in motorboats, fill them with diesel, and drive 200 miles away through the ocean for sometimes 20 hours at a time to get to where the walrus are, and then maybe not come back with the walrus. Fortunately, um, after having a really heavy assignment on St. Lawrence Island, um, I felt like I needed something to lift my spirits a little bit. Um, and I went to Greenland. I was really surprised by how, uh, what a beautiful place Greenland and its people were, and how well they've done for themselves. Greenland has had a really strong anti-colonial streak, and in the late 1970s were, um, had a revolution where the people basically rose up against the Danish colonial government and said, we want autonomy, and they won it. They won the self-governance, uh, and they've since then have been slowly reclaiming their Inuit identity and Inuit heritage. Uh, Greenland is particularly unique because it's one of the few places in the world where the indigenous community is truly a sovereign community. They have their own country, so they can make their own laws and it can be based on their own culture. I, I, I figured this out really quick when I arrived in Greenland and um, I sat down, uh, when I got to Nuuk, it was 2 a.m. I was walking around on the rocks just to get a sense of the place and these two teenage girls walked by and one of them was carrying a, a speaker, a little boom box and she was playing some music. And in that moment, listening to that music, I knew right away that this was a place that was going to be healthier because they were able to talk about their grievances and moved through it. We're looking for a seal for our family's meal so we can stay warm. We can't afford the food at the store. What are we supposed to do? We're looking for a seal. Please leave us alone. Greenland is still a really beautiful, mythical place as well. And um, this is the last project we're going to talk about because this is a wonderful blend between worlds. It's full of romance, it's full of modernity, and it's also got um, problems as well, uh, um, but Greenland has dealt with it. And one of the ways in which it's dealt with it is traditional kayaking. I went to Greenland to cover the Greenland National Championships, which is also called the Greenland National Kayaking Championships, because kayaking is the national sport of Greenland. Um, Everything uh, that sea, modern sea kayaking, your, the kayaking that happens in white water, all of that is derived from Greenland. Uh, originally in Greenland, people lived by subsistence when hunting from kayaks, so hunted, hunting seals by going out and throwing harpoons from kayaks and sneaking up on them. Today, Greenland um, being a modern, modern market-based economy um, still does subsistence, but it's very different and it's no longer done from kayaks but kayaks have become a sport where everyone continues to embrace their Inuit heritage and their tradition. 
and it's a very beautiful place uh, because uh, there's the presence of colonial Danish design. But in the capital city of Nuuk, you can see that, in fact, it's quite modern. There are high rises. Um, it's a modern city with a lot of educated people who are doing a lot of the same jobs that you will find in any other nation. The beginning of the men's kayak race. See, some people are clearly um, <laughs> in better shape than others. <laughs> Um, the Greenland Kayaking Championships aren't all kayaking. I mean, even from the very beginning, I mean, this is the, uh, what is called Greenland Rope Gymnastics. It's an Arctic-specific game I mean, where originally young people trained to get into kayaks so that they would learn strength, agility, and balance. And the championships themselves have kind of moved beyond uh, some of the original rolling. Um, so rolling is a really big part of kayaking. Uh, there is, people practice uh, rolling, which is basically capsizing and then recovering from a capsize. Um, back in the day, it was quite possible that you would get tangled in your harpoon line or that a seal would come back and try to bite you uh, and, so, uh, and push you over. Um, it's possible that the walrus on your line would pull you so that it would capsize you. And so you have to learn all the different ways of riding yourself and the water is cold. So now they're so good at it that they're able to do this one-armed roll synchronized. <laughs> and everybody gets involved. Right? So it's a family affair, um, this, and this is the boys' portage race. But don't forget the water is super cold. It's in the upper 30s Fahrenheit. One of the cool things that I love about the way that they have, um, uh, Greenlanders have created their sport is that they have um, instituted the, uh, a lot of traditions by, making sh by demanding that the traditional kayaking parka be made of seal skin. So that in that way, it ensures that the knowledge of processing seals, of sewing the skin garments, of hunting, um, of dealing with the meat, all of these things are not lost because they're central to the culture. And of course, in Greenland, marine mammals are still a really big part of um, both of the, the identity of Greenland and also the food and also the deep respect for the land. Um, this is a fin whale, the smaller cousin of the blue whale. One of the things that Greenland has been really good at doing um, in recent times is elevating and taking pride in who they are and their heritage and where it comes from. Um, on the right here, you've got some beluga maktak, which is uh, skin and blubber. And the, they have been able to, in recent times, um, bring it up as an internationally renowned, recognized cuisine, basically a way of saying to the outside world, look at us, the food that we eat is no worse than the food that you eat. This is no, there's um, nothing to be ashamed of here. We're proud of our food and it's reached the um, international status. Uh, another way in which that's done is uh, through traditional tattooing. Uh, tattooing has made a comeback in Greenland. Uh, Maya Siluk here um, has uh, become a traditional tattooer and she is very strict about uh, tattoo designs. Um, unlike Western tattoos, there, all of these specific designs come from specific groups and have specific meanings coming from their, their shamanic tradition. So they're very careful about all the meanings behind these different things. Yet another way that Greenlanders keep their tradition strong is by um, doing things like in, uh, saying that the caribou hunt can only happen by dog sled. So you can't drive a four-wheeler up uh, shoot a caribou and then drag it home. In fact, you have to go by dog sled. So north of the village of Sisimut, all the dogs are Greenlandic Huskies in order to keep the, the strain pure. And it's a way of ensuring not only that the Greenlandic Huskies uh, are pure, but also that they have strong working dogs that they're able to use to go hunting with. And Greenland is not all ice and frozen. In fact, in the summertime, the forts, fjords are beautiful and they're filled with flowers. Um, and even some really amazing herbs, which some of you might know, including rhodiola, which is uh, also known as Arctic ginseng. Mm -hmm. 
But of course, Greenland is renowned for its icebergs. An iceberg is different than the sea ice. Uh, an iceberg means that the ice has calved off from a glacier, which means that whenever you're looking at an iceberg, you're looking at ice that's thousands of years old, uh, different than sea ice, which is often only a couple of years old. So we come back full circle to whaling in Alaska. So as we come back to Alaska, I want to tell you a little bit of a little story about how whaling came to be um, uh, in recent times. In the 1970s, the US government went to Alaska and sent up uh, a team of scientists to count the bowhead whales. And the scientists came back and they said, there are 800 whales here. And they looked around at the Inupiaq and said, you guys are hunting too many whales. In just a few years, the whales will be extinct. And the Inupiaq elders looked at the scientists and said, you guys are crazy. There are many times more whales than that, many, many times more than that. You think we don't know how to manage our own whale population? So a few of the elders were really far seeing and they knew that without whales, without whaling, that their culture would die, would suffer. And so they hired lawyers and they took, uh, they socked away some money and used that money to bring the lead U.S. government scientist up and give him equipment and they developed a new system, a system of acoustic sounding where they were able to drag sonar out to the edge of the ice with the hunters and plant them in the water. And using sonar tracking and advanced statistical analysis, for the first time they were able to get a new count and when they had that count a few years later, it was 8,000, a tenfold increase from their original estimate. So, the Inupiaq won the right to manage their own population. But how is it, how is it that the Inupiaq knew more than scientists? How is it that they, I mean, you know, science has given us a lot of things. Uh, very clearly, um, without science, we wouldn't have things like lights. Um, yet somehow, Inupiaq known things that scientists still don't understand how it is that Inupiaq were able to understand the population of the whales. We now call this traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK, and scientists have come to understand that there are many things um, about ecology in particular that indigenous peoples know and understand because they are able to look at the world from a holistic point of view, from direct observation through generations and millennia. Um, in general, Inupiaq don't like to give answers to questions. They don't like to give direct answers. They will mull on things and think on things and observe for things for a very long time before an answer ever appears. But there's something more to it than that. It's not just direct observation. Could there be another way of thinking about it? Um, in the 1980s, there was a well-respected Yupiak whaling captain called Harry Brower Sr. Um, and when one day he was in Anchorage and at night in a dream a baby whale came to him and that baby whale was crying and told Harry in his dream that its mother had been harpooned and told him who had done the harpooning and which boat it was and at what time it had gotten harpooned and also said that if future generations of whales and Inupiaq were to live together that changes would have to be made and it told him how those future generations would be able to work together. So in the morning, when Harry woke, um, he got a call from the village of Ukiabik, and they told him they had harpooned a pregnant female whale, and they told him what time it had happened, and who had harpooned it, and all those things matched up. So Harry went back to his village, and he created the guidelines, that n many of the guidelines that now mark the way forward for a Nipiak whaling and help to manage the whale population to this day. In 2011, the last uh, full whale census, there were 17,000 whale, which is what uh, people believe is higher than pre-European contact. So the Nipiak have been able to raise the bowhead whale population to before Europeans arrived. When I started, working with uh, the, when I started working in the Arctic um, and with the Inupiaq, I was really interested in uh, understanding their culture, to be able to see through the eyes of the Inupiaq. Not all indigenous cultures, in fact, um, native cultures are largely very different from each other. 
my culture, even though we are subarctic, is as different from the Nupiak culture as uh, Norway is from Greece, right? Very, very different, even though we live in some of the climates. And um, when I first arrived, it's a little bit like learning a new language. You know, I, I found myself uh, falling back in my old ways and thinking, not wanting to go out and meet people and try to speak. But then some time passed. I started to get more comfortable and more curious and more interested in what like language, what I could learn and what I could um, do. I got more excited about my ability to be, um, to be able to think in this new way. And then one day when you learn a language, it's no longer, it's no longer something you have to think about. You start dreaming in that language. <sighs> when you learn the language of another culture, the camera becomes more than just a photographic tool, it becomes um, a universal translator. I think the camera can show us things that we can know, but there's no way to articulate. I think the greatest photographs bring us together because they can bypass words. It's my hope that through photography, one day all of our dreams will be able to be as rich as the sun shining through the ice fog. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the same as the uh, Robert Flaherty documentary, Nanook of the North? Yes, uh, so uh, Nanook is a word that's pretty recognizable, especially for English speakers across the Arctic, because uh, um, across the Arctic it's Inuit peoples, and so the language dialects are, uh, they're very different to uh, the original speakers of the language, but to English ears it mostly sounds the same. Uh, so in Greenland, you'll say Nanuk, and then I'm in Alaska, it's Nanuk. Uh, not that different. I'm probably not even saying it right, really, but, <laughs> but yes, it's the same word. Yeah. Any other questions? How did you do all of the aerial shots? Um, most of the aerial shots are done by drone. It becomes, um, flying a drone in the Arctic is uh, you know, a little bit technically challenging, but the biggest challenge of all is um, not the, whether you can fly or not, but it's whether you've got the trust of the people that are flying around. So if a whaling captain sees you flying a drone around, they will shoot it down, literally with a shotgun. Um, you have to have not only clearance from the, um, the whaling commission, but also the support of the people and the trust of everyone there. Um, everyone recognizes that if the, uh, if the images are used and politicized, then there could be in the end of whaling for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. With such a high suicide rate, is there also a huge alcoholism problem there? Um, yeah, actually, so that's a, something I forgot to mention, um, and I think that's really good. Yeah, there's definitely an alcohol problem, absolutely. And um, one of the things I forgot to talk about is that, um, in fact, in Greenland, 30 years ago, a lot of people told me that alcoholism was a rampant problem. Yet in just 30 years' time, it's, uh, it's gotten to the levels uh, that you would find in any first world nation. Um, so it's really interesting. But yes, alcoholism is definitely a problem uh, there. The other thing that I wanted to say too is that St. Lawrence Island really isn't a place where it's just sort of destitute and everything's going wrong. We had a study come out last May that showed for the first time since the 1980s the suicide rate is falling in St. Lawrence Island. And I was already beginning to see the signs of that. Um, and it's attributed to the fact that mental health programs have appeared on St. Lawrence and in Western Alaska and they're community led. So for the first time, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, people started saying, oh, instead of coming in from the outside and creating these programs that we think you should do, they consulted with the elders and the elders said, this is what we want to do. This is how we're going to um, raise our kids. We will come up with it ourselves and just help us do this. And uh, since that time, we started to see the suicide rate fall.
the availability of internet, TV, et cetera, is there a large migration of the younger kids, the younger generation? Um, not really. Across the Arctic, we haven't really seen that. Um, in Greenland, there's quite a bit of migration back and forth between Denmark and Greenland. Um, that's, you know, if you want to get an education, by and large, you have to go to Copenhagen. So that's a big part of it. And you definitely see Greenlanders that will end up staying in Denmark, but by and large, you don't see a massive migration. In fact, um, on St. Lawrence, um, the problem is that there is uh, actually no migration. So we actually often see kids will get scholarships because they're quite smart and recommended by the teachers and to, so they'll end up getting scholarships to universities in Anchorage or Fairbanks and they'll go, they'll go for a half a year or a year, but they invariably leave and go back home because the, the culture is too weird. The feeling of everyone being out for themselves, for not caring about family, it's too hard for them. So despite, it's despite the fact that they're returning home to a place where there's almost no future for them, they would rather be that to do that than be around a bunch of people that only care about themselves. Yeah. Well, and it, uh, that's how they feel about it anyway. <laughs> uh -huh. One of the first photos showed a woman with a fur, with little tiny white, they look very small, little white, like nails. Oh, oh, right. Uh -huh. What was that? I mean, it doesn't look like a bear. Um, that's a, that's a pretty good guess, actually. It is a little bear. Uh, it's a wolverine. Uh, yeah. So the wolverine fur is the most prized of all the furs for using for parka ruffs because it doesn't build up hoarfrost. Um, your breath won't freeze on it nearly as readily as it will for others. Um, polar bear fur also is similar, um, but it, you, you pretty much have to be a whaling captain to have a polar bear ruff. <laughs> uh, I'm the way that I speak, you mean? Well, some of the words... Like nanok? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, Inupiaq words, um, Inuit languages um, have a lot of sounds in them that are in English, and then they, the language is additive, so instead of speaking um, an entire sentence, um, you can say an entire sentence in one word, oftentimes. In, that's particularly evident in Greenlandic, where you can have a word that's you know, 30 characters long, um, and, and you know, it means a whole set of things. But yes, there's a lot of ka and ka, um, k and t sounds. And, and what's weird to uh, also um, m many uh, European speakers is that a word is changed not based on the first syllable or the first sound, but on the last sound. And so kayak and kayat. I mean, those, uh, that's singular and plural. And so kayak is one and kayak is two, or uh, more than two. Sounds yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> it's hard. Uh -huh. Okay, so if you have a high incidence of alcoholism, mm -hmm. do they have uh, recovery programs like Alcoholics Anonymous? Um, I've never really seen that. It's possible, but I've never seen any evidence that there's anything quite like that. Uh, dealing with alcoholism, there's lots of different ways that the communities deal with alcoholism. Um, and a lot of the communities are dry communities. So the alcohol still appears, of course, but it is much harder to get it. I mean, bringing it in isn't, uh, and people have to sneak it in by and large. And there's a lot of social censure over it too, so um, that's a really big part of it. But yes, it's not, um, by and large, what we see um, with the, the statistics is that the alcoholism declines when people have a future to look forward to, when they have an, an economic system that supports them, that's part of the modern economy, because um, the subsistence economy no longer works but if you can't take part in the modern world, there's no jobs for you, then um, it's really easy to be an alcoholic. Thank you. 
Sorry. Could you, <coughs> excuse me, could you comment on the traditional roles of gender in Inupiaca societies and, um, and how, if, if at all, has changed in different geographical locations and due to what circumstances? That's a great question. That's a fantastic question, actually. Um, so I, I remember um, when I was on assignment um, here in Ukalik, um, there came in the springtime, there is a woman who came up and was also photographing for a separate story. And she actually came to do a story on what was the, the first female harpooner, the first female whaler. Um, and so she went and stayed with that crew and brought back a story. And you know, I was interested and curious about this because I knew Bernadette, uh, but I also was sort of suspicious that the that this fit really nicely into the kind of Western narrative of oh um, look, here are women being oppressed and here they're breaking out for the first time in the modern era. So I started asking around a little bit, and you know, when you the thing about um, a, a lot of native cultures is that people don't really like to give you um, straight answers because that assumes that you know. And so when people give you kind of answers that are a little bit sideways um, um, and give you a portion of the truth. Um, and what I was able to find out as I started asking around is that in fact, when you ask enough times, uh, it turns out that she's not the first uh, woman harpooner, not by a long shot, um, but maybe the first one in, in uh, recent memory. So uh, there, are, and there are lots and lots of female whalers I, it's just that she was the first um, female harpooner in a while to come around. And as I started to ask around a little bit more, you can start to see that there's little cracks in this idea that it's, a, that it's patriarchic. You know, you imagine with a whaling crew, that would be a bunch of men going out there with their harpoons, but it's actually really it doesn't quite feel like that. There are moments when it feels like that. But by and large, it's much more subtle than that. So um, women, for example, the most important person in uh, New Piak society is traditionally not the whaling captain, but the whaling captain's wife. And you still see that. Um, in fact, the word for whaling captain's wife is not the way that it's set up in English, right? So you don't describe her uh, as an addition to him, right? Whaling captain's wife. She has her own word. <laughs> um, and so um, that's very interesting. But um, I will say this, Christianity has definitely changed the uh, roles of gender um, a, among Arctic societies. And Arctic native cultures have embraced Christianity a lot, very hard. So you still see there are um, sort of, uh, it's a mixture of different beliefs now, and things are kind of uh, changing back and forth. It's very fluid, just like with every culture that's around, including, um, modern American cultures, we see how fluid gender is happening right now. It's happening everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Along those same lines, I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, that Native Ameri some Native Americans have a different concept of time than we civilize. <laughs> uh, that I, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe the English have different differences in who they are, how they are, what makes them that are, oh, I don't know, just different from how we might view the world. Well, I'll definitely, we definitely say, um, there are, there are, lots of my friends will say things like, we're on Indian time now. You know, yeah, and that's absolutely the truth. And I, you know, I hope we're on res time, or um, we're on native time. And you, you know, you you even actually see this in um, Western society too. Like people will talk about being on island time, right? So you, I mean, there's that same sort of sense of you're not looking at the clock; you're flowing with the pattern of nature. And I think that's sort of inevitable. If you live close to the land, then you move at a different pace. But certainly, certainly in native communities, um, there's a different sense of time. Um, I, uh, that being said, everyone is part of the modern world and we have to, because of schools, for example, everyone has to go to school and come back. 
we, we look at clocks now, you know, so that sense of time is definitely fluid, especially when it's, say, like the summertime and school is out and everyone is hunting and fishing and gathering berries. Uh, and so, you know, you're on camp time. And in the Arctic, in the summertime, there's no, uh, you start to lose a sense of when the day is, when the midday is, because the light is up all the time. So there's no nighttime even to like, to bookend the days. Um, but I don't, uh, there are, because Native America is composed of so many different cultures and they're so vastly different, um, I definitely can comment on uh, that feeling, the distinct differences between the yeah, ideas of time. We're, we're almost out of time. I, I want to ask you a really quick question. <laughs> um, can you just yeah. tell us really quickly, this is kind of hard to do, about your experience photographing uh, Standing Rock? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Standing Rock was um, an amazing experience. I'll have to say, um, driving into Standing Rock and uh, coming to the camp for the first time and walking out and seeing the flags up hundreds and thousands of Native nations made my heart melt. It was an, an amazing feeling to be there and to um, feel the unity uh, between all of us. And it, it, you have to remember that uh, Native nations have been at odds with each other for a long time. I remember when I was there um, and it, it was, there was this hush that came over everybody one day uh, when there was word that the there was a crow contingent uh, uh, coming in, a crow group coming in. Um, and lots of Lakota and Dakota and crow have been at odd, you know, have been mortal enemies for a very long time. And the fact that they were coming to support uh, the Lakota cause at Standing Rock was a really big deal. And it was an amazing feeling. And photographing also uh, is really interesting to see. Um, the, there were lots of photographers as the protest uh, began to gain steam. You saw lots and lots of photographers. And uh, Standing Rock began to sort of control its, uh, who it was letting in um, so that you didn't have random freelancers showing up, um, from the non-native freelancers who were out to uh, just advance their careers. And I, I actually heard a person um, who was walking by, I, uh, a young person with a camera walking by and saying, I can't believe how great these pictures look. This is going to be so great for my career. You know, you can imagine how that feels to um, a Lakota for whom this is like life and death, you know, the, uh, their water. Um, so, but photographing, I, by and large, am not drawn to the stories of uh, the front lines. You know, I'm not really interested in uh, looking at that. I'm much more interested in the quiet stories, the story of all the people who are supporting, the story of the culture that's going on behind the scenes. Standing Rock became the thing that it was, but how, many, how much uh, grief and um, resistance was there building up before Standing Rock happened? And in a way, photographing Standing Rock was a way of like looking back at this moment when it all just came together for a moment um, and brought all these different people together. Um, more than anything, I was found that as I walked around, there was so much pride. There's so much pride for um, everyone to be there, to be able to let loose and just be, feel free to be native, to have other people understand, and to be the majority. And it was an amazing thing to see non-natives come in, um, a lot of them for the first time, and to be a minority um, in a completely different culture for the first time, and on, on seeing them trying to navigate that world. And it made me really proud uh, for them, too, to see that they wanted to come in and understand and learn um, learn the rules and start to figure out uh, how we could all be closer together. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, unfortunately, we have to get out of here because there's a film this evening. So all right. Thank you, everybody. Uh -huh.